A big hello to the video. Hi, video in the back. Uh, can everybody hear okay? Can everybody hear Dave okay? Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Mike Piernot, and uh, my friend here is David Dave Stanek. Yep. Uh, we work at American Greetings Interactive, and one of the things we get to do is uh, sort out security issues and try to make sure that our developers are educated about security issues and, and how to be doing things in a good way because the, the web is a, a mean, scary place. Um, many folks may have guessed that uh, I still have feelings about Firefly. Uh, I thought this was kind of an inspirational title because really what we're going to do today is get into the mindset of, of being a bad guy. And, and a lot of times, you know, our, our beloved cast and crew of, of the Serenity are not always uh, doing the most above board things. Uh, so I want to ask a, a question. Who out here uh, has web applications that are live in production? All right, who has vulnerable web applications that are live in production? <laughs> All right, so we're going to hopefully uh, address some of that today. So why does this kind of stuff matter? Well, it matters to your users who trust you and value you with their information, it could be financial data, it could be personal information, it could be medical information, and you owe it to them to protect their data. It's your data too, and you don't want that to leak out into the world and, and have bad people do things with it. Um, I think the estimate that I saw most recently, uh, if you have like a financial data breach, uh, can be as much as $200, $214 per record, uh, of the breach, so in terms of all the uh, identity theft protection and services that you have to do and recovery and, and so forth. So that matters a lot to your business as well. Like that could be, if you have you know, millions of credit card numbers and that gets leaked, you could be looking at a pretty much like game over situation for your business. So it's, it behooves you to bake in security rather than trying to bolt it on later uh, and, and be conscious about security issues. So today we're going to talk about the OWASP uh, top 10 a lot. Uh, OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project, and it's a nonprofit that's focused on improving software security. Uh, and they provide documentation and tools that help uh, educate you and uh, other developers about security and help you learn to protect your applications. So the top 10 uh, vulnerabilities are based on risk data from eight different firms uh, with over 500,000 vulnerabilities that they um, select and prioritize and look at for prevalence, exploitability, detectability, and their impact to your organization or to your users. And it was just recently updated for 2013. So we're going to use the 2013 top 10. And what we're going to do today is we'll talk a little bit of background on each type of vulnerability. Then we're going to do an exploit against it. We're actually going to attack a little toy application, and uh, you get to put your black hat, or maybe a gray hat is more appropriate, but you get to put your bad guy hat on and uh, do bad things to it. And then we'll talk about prevention and provide some uh, Django-specific advice where possible. Um, and so show of hands, who's mostly doing Django? Or OK, so a few people have some Django experience. Uh, Flask. Um, I'm not as hip to Flask yet, so I'm. We can talk about yeah, we can talk about some of the general things. Yeah. And so before we get started, uh, just a quick disclaimer: a lot of the things that you're going to be doing today against your own computer with this little toy application could be considered criminal acts if you do them against somebody else's organization or somebody else's website without their permission. So one, please don't do that. That would be bad. Uh, and. It's good to note that uh, both Dave and myself and the conference staff disclaim all liability for what you do with the knowledge that you gain here today. So please only use your powers for good and not for evil. We're here to try to help make your apps more secure, uh, not to have you go do bad things to people who don't need bad things done to them. So an awful lot of you, many of you have laptops. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you don't. Uh, we recommend pairing or finding a partner. Uh, if you're having any setup issues, that can really help as well. Uh, plus, it's a great way to get to know people around you, uh, network with people here at the conference. Uh, so folks want to grab partners, now is a great time to do that. Uh, it really helps, I think, to be able to talk through some of these things with another person and, and pick apart the solution with somebody. 
All right. So some uh, setup stuff. Uh, is anybody not set up yet? Wow. Okay, so you're just waiting on stuff to download. Do you want to? Uh, so we have a couple different ways we can do setup. We can do it uh, with a virtual env and waiting for stuff to download, or we have uh, USB sticks that have uh, virtual box and an uh, image. Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. So everybody looks like we're pretty much set up. Um, I will skim past all of this stuff so we can copy stuff from VirtualBox. We can double click on stuff and install stuff and we can start the VM. Has everybody got their VM started if you're doing the VM? Okay, cool. So you should have a little box that pops up and with a bootloader and you tell it, yes, I want to go ahead and boot. Um, and so everybody who has that installed already, uh, you should be able to go to localhost 8000 in your browser and give a shout if you have problems with that. Uh, if you're doing the manual setup way, uh, you'd be making a virtual env. How many people are doing virtual env versus, okay, you guys are trying virtual env, you guys are trying virtual env. Are you, are you, everybody, you set up okay? Yeah, okay. Set up last night. Oh, awesome, my hero. That's the best. Uh, everybody who's doing virtual env, do you already have the instructions handy? You guys have instructions handy if you need them for the virtual env stuff? Do you guys want one of these? Okay. Oh, okay, they're, they're, you guys are in download hell, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was, I was having bad problems with the... Okay. Cool. Do you want me to hand you a couple of USBs now? All right. All right. So once you've once you got your uh, virtual env, uh, there's a repo to clone, which we had up earlier. Most people probably have this done already because you all were super prompt and got here like 20 minutes beforehand because you're awesome. And once you've got the uh, repository pulled down, uh, your next thing to do is just install dependencies. Uh, we use pip, so we'll pip install dash r the requirements. If you don't have pip, you should get pip because pip is good and is much more secure now than it was a few months ago. It's now checking SSL certs and doing all its stuff over HTTPS now, which is very, very good. So kudos to those guys for getting that infrastructure ready. And once you've got that uh, all set with the repo and the requirements, uh, starting up a Django app is basically just going into that source directory and running python manage.py run server, and that'll start that up. If you're doing the VM, it should already have started up automatically and should be available on localhost 8000 for you. Okay, hands up if you are excited and ready to go and starting an exercise or starting to do something. Okay, who's hands up if you're keep keep them up if you're if you're all set and good. Okay, you guys still getting set? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the network is sad. Let me know if you want to just do the virtual box thing because it's just copy and double click some stuff and you're good to go. Oh, do we having issues with it before? He, it's failed three or four times on his, on his virtual. Going faster on that. Okay. I just can't get virtual box. Oh, I'm almost a third of the way. 
All right, we'll just do, do like two more minutes of, of setup here. It hasn't failed this time yet. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Keep getting read timeouts. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so you guys might want to like do a row swap or something because then you guys could pair with somebody who's got it set up and we could get moving faster, possibly. E whatever you're comfortable with, but. If we, if we miss one, it's not yeah. Like yeah. Is, Okay. Yeah. I don't like yep. I would like to get set up on my Okay. Actually what I did is I just, I just clicked on this and then I launched the There's page. Going, man. Yeah. 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 Click on that one. That'll import the image for you. Just click continue. Yeah. I mean I'm actually uh good. Uh, 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 yeah. I can record the cost numbers I, well, so Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, that's cool. Um, if you want to do stuff, I would say, like, pair up with somebody who's got a laptop ready to go and... Okay. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll, walk, we'll walk through the solutions and everything, too, so, yeah. All right, are there any objections if we go ahead and get started? All right, cool. All right, so the number one uh, most prevalent web app vulnerability is injection attacks. So what's an injection attack? That's when an application is sending you untrusted data uh, into an interpreter. And that interpreter then goes and executes something or does something bad with that data. Uh, so that can result in data loss and uh, data corruption, uh, lack of accountability, uh, denial of access to that data, and in bad situations can lead to a complete takeover of your host. Uh, and nobody wants that. So, who can you trust? Right, so external users can get tricked into using uh, some malicious link, administrative users, and internal users. You mean well, it looks legitimate, you want to click it, and now your access has been exploited uh, for access by bad guys. So, different attack vectors that this can take on. Uh, get parameters in the query string coming into your web app. Uh, it can be in post parameters. Uh, you can have problems with uh, bad things in the, the path info of, say, uh, a dynamic URL where some portion of the URL path is input that's going to come into your application. And maybe it's you know, like a category for your uh, e-commerce site. And you read that data in. And if, Depending on what's in there, it could, could be bad if uh, uh, played back or done uh, without a uh, proper amount of, of screening. Uh, some HTTP headers uh, are untrustworthy, like cookie and host, because those are things coming in from the client. Uh, uploaded files don't have to be what they purport to be or what you expect them to be. So your you know, awesome image hosting for dogs or whatever uh, VC-funded awesome thing uh, might uh, not be able to trust the photos that are coming at it. So what kind of stuff might happen? Well, a malicious user could create a SQL that would be harmful to you or other kinds of queries. Uh, maybe something that abuses uh, your LDAP server or uh, dredges up some vulnerability in your, in your LDAP server. Um, can access private files on your disk, like Etsy password. Uh, arbitrary code execution. That's no fun. Uh, we had people with arbitrary code execution problems recently. I'm trying to remember if there's a... Rails had it, right? Uh, last year at CodeMash, I think that was Rails. Yeah, like, right, like in January, if you saw Rails devs running around with their hair on fire and people like scrambling to update their Rails sites, uh, that was because of this kind of flaw. So it's very prevalent. Um, yeah, so some real-world examples. Uh, Sony PlayStation, you guys probably heard about that too. Uh, that was a SQL injection, a series of SQL injection attacks. Uh, Ruby on Rails had a problem with uh, code execution. Um, and there's this awesome uh, ESPN short link. Dave, can you tell people what that's about? Yeah, so I was, uh, I, I do fantasy football, so I use the ESPN site to manage that stuff. And I noticed one day that when they gave me an error message, the error message on the screen was in the query string. 
So I was just messing around with it. I added basically an HTML table in the query string with my info, my picture, saying that I'm like a fantasy football leader and all my stats. And I sent that link to uh, Bitly, and it noticed it was an ESPN.com link. It gave me this awesome shortener. So it looks official. So I can send this to you, and you get a link to ESPN that shows me as this great fantasy football player. And I didn't really have to do a whole lot of work. It was just a little bit of HTML jamming into the query string. Yeah, so I think they fixed your original vulnerability, but they still have one in their error page that they redirect you to. Yeah, you can't inject arbitrary HTML, just some parts of HTML now. Yeah, so, so at least they fixed the bad stuff. Yeah. But yeah, so big name people are making this mistake all the time. And I would prefer it if no one did it ever again. So the first thing we're going to talk about is SQL injection. So this is where some unescaped user input causes the premature end of a SQL query. So you want to be looking to terminate uh, a query early, allowing you to jam in a second malicious query. So uh, if everybody's got their uh, demo app spun up, uh, you want to go to the first exercise. You can either use the next links on there to get to the SQL injection stuff. Uh, you can use the left nav to go straight to SQL injection or to in the, into the injection attacks. Uh, or just point your browser to localhost 8000 slash injection slash SQL. Um, and what are we going to do with this? We're going to do like 10 minutes and get people revved up. So the exercise is designed for you to experiment with it a little bit. If you're already familiar with how to do these things, it'll probably be a lot easier. If you're not, you'll experiment a little bit. It'll try to give you a couple hints to say do this or do that. You know, add these kind of comments here um, to kind of help you along the way. But we'll also walk around and help people out you know, just to get to the through each exercise. Yeah, so we basically have a query that looks something like that. And you're going to go do some bad stuff to it. Yeah, most of you are just trying to drop that table. Yep. OK, so everybody got a chance. I think uh, we saw a lot of successes so far. So what does this actually look like? Um, let's try to draw. Oh, look at that. My browser remembered this from last time. How charming. Yay, I'm correct. So uh, basically what we're doing here is we need the close quote and semicolon to end the first select. Then we go and drop our uh, table of users. Then we throw in a SQL comment so that everything else in the query is going to be commented out. An additional apostrophe to deal with the other side of the uh, apostrophe that we had in there. And then this is left, so yeah, this is left over from the original query. Has anyone seen this before, SQL injection? Has anyone had it happen to them before? One person, that's, not, that's pretty good. Brave soul. So, I mean, this is scary how easy this is, right? So, I knew it at least. Yeah. Well, that's good. Did you know when you put it in production, or did you find out after? <laughs> that, that's kind of scary, because it is, with a simple flaw, it's really easy to do this kind of stuff. So you used like a third party thing that had the problem? And Yeah, I mean, it's scary that you don't have control over this, some of that stuff. And you, know, you can download third-party open source commercial software, and something like that just works. Yeah. OK, so uh, on to the next exercise while we're still in injection land. Can you answer a quick question? Yeah. If you did put a name in, so uh, some characters to the yeah. left of the first quote, would that still? Yeah, that still would have done stuff. We were probably being a little too strict on our checking, but because we're mostly trying to focus on just the, the actual vulnerability. But yeah, you can put in you know, some name or something to pad that out so it looks legit. Yeah. And, and this also depends on the SQL engine. right? If you use an Oracle or MySQL, you're going to have different things than if you're using Postgres. So it, it, part of what the attacker has to do is determine what software you're running to figure out the right way to exploit something like this. And maybe try just a few different variants of it as well. Yeah, I mean, there, there's automated scripts that just rip yeah. through and try this stuff yeah. over and over again. So the next bad thing we're going to do to ourselves is access some private files. 
So uh, for our next exercise, we're going to be doing some file system access uh, with unvalidated user input and navigating the file system. And is there anything else? Is there stuff you want to say about it, Dave? Uh, not ahead of time. Okay. It's another very similar exercise. Yeah, so you can get to it just by hitting the next link here, and it'll go on and get you started. And what do you think? You want to you look at that example link and try to figure out how to exploit it. Yeah. What do you think for this one, like five, ten minutes, eight minutes, six, six minutes? Seven, seven minutes, oh, okay. Yeah, this one's not too bad. All right. Everybody, uh, hands, hands up if you got this one okay. Yeah. All right. So let's see what this one looks like. Uh, oh, we've got this terrible hacker graphic. Oh, no. And what happens if we... Start marching up the file system. Oh, and there's our settings. And what terrible bad things might happen in here? Right up at the top. Oh, yeah, right up at the top, right? You can have uh, bad stuff in here that someone might be able to see and then figure out another way to use that, those credentials to get back into the database and just do whatever right? they want. Imagine getting, like, the shadow password file or any of the other secrets you keep on your box that you think are safe, but you've accidentally exposed this way. Right. Yes. What was the question? Uh, so the question was, will the slides and exercises and everything be available after the session? Uh, yes, the, the exercises are up on GitHub. Uh, I will publish an updated version of the slides as well. Slides are already online from uh, PyCon. Uh, handouts and everything is, is available online. Um, indefinitely. Yep. Well, every time we do this, we'll update it with the TEP10 and you know keep it going. Yeah. So ba basically, like when we get done today, I'm going to go up to GitHub and I'm going to get the current PDFs of the slides and everything and make a release on GitHub that has all that stuff. So. Yeah. Um, did you get? If you want it, the links for all that are is in the the paper version of the handout. Um, so if you didn't get one, I can sh get one of these shot back to you. Awesome. All right, so the last of our injection attacks that we're going to do today is about arbitrary code execution. Uh, so that's where we're going to get some unsafe input and have it dynamically evaluated and executed and bad, terrible things will happen. And you can start that up again just by hitting the next there. So this one, you will be writing a little bit of Python code, like a, a short one-liner. Um, and it, the first time you attempt it, it'll show you kind of some hints. So if you just put anything in there, it should show you a, a couple things to think about. Probably this one a little shorter. Just because there's Python code involved, it's maybe five minutes. five minutes? Should you want to do five minutes? I think so. I'll do six, and we'll see how people get. And time is up for this one. How did everybody do with it? Yeah. Okay. So basically, basically, uh, Dave, you want to walk through the solution on this? Yeah. I mean, essentially, all we needed to do is create the file. Right? So this is just the one liner here to create the file. And this little bit of code actually does the base64 of the string version of that code, because we need to pass in that code to the web server for it to, ex to actually execute it. So this is actually, it looks kind of funny, but this actually works on a lot of different, like WordPress and a lot of other open source things have been known to have some of these issues. And there, it's, the nice thing about open source is that someone finds it right away and it gets fixed very quickly. But just the ability to take a piece of code and run it as that user on someone else's server is pretty scary. So this is, our little solution here is going to automatically do that base64 encoding for us and give us this nasty gross value, and when they got submitted, all right, we just pwned ourselves. So now imagine if your web server or your application server ran as like the root user or something really bad, then anything you could put into this little string here would execute as the root user. So you could put in something that actually downloads code from somewhere else and just runs it, you know, an installer for a, a root kit or something like that. All right, so that is injection. So how do we prevent this? 
Step one, validate all input from users. All the input. You want to make sure you sign your cookies and don't accept any cookies where the signature is bogus or missing. And if you're talking to a database, you want to use an ORM or use, make sure you use bind variables if you're writing SQL. That way, the ORM or the bind variables take care of all the escaping for you. Don't use eval, exec, beware of pickle, uh, beware of user supplied YAML. I think that was the Rails thing. Bad news. Uh, so be real careful with that. Um, cookie signing is pretty good combined with SSL, but you'll want to sign with a user specific key so that uh, you can avoid getting hit by something like Fire Sheep uh, that makes it trivial to like hang out at your Starbucks and steal people's Facebook accounts before they went all HTTPS. So if you're doing Django stuff, what do we do? So we want to make sure your data types for your model are tight. Do you want to talk about that a little, Dave? Yeah, I mean, right. it's just simply you want to make sure that you're using the right type of, for the data, right? You don't want to use a string for everything. You want to make sure that if you expect it to be a certain thing, that you validate that and try to do as best that you can to make sure that it is what it should be, a number, um, an email address or whatever. And Django provides a lot of like high level ones, but a lot of times in an application you need your own specific types. So you, you know, don't be afraid to make those things. Right, so you want to use forms uh, instead of model forms for stronger validation. And absolutely don't be afraid of making uh, new validators uh, for your application. So uh, those things will have the right context to understand what it is. Don't just say something like, oh, it's a generic string. And any, any framework, and I know a lot of people aren't using Django here, but any framework that you use right now should have some kind of validator system. Yeah, like if you're doing right. Flask and you're using WTF, same kind of concept. Uh, if you're using one of the many platforms that uses uh, form, and form and code, don't be afraid to make custom validators for it. Uh, in URLs, make sure the regular expressions, uh, especially in Django, uh, for your dynamic URLs are tight. You don't want to have something leak in that could uh, do harm to you, like, like we talked about, uh, the, like a category page on your e-commerce site, where you don't necessarily want to know every one of those things in advance, but you want to make sure that you screen out bad stuff. Yeah, if it's alphanumeric, then make sure that you make it, make sure it's alphanumeric. Yeah. yeah. Uh, use the ORM when you can, and when you can't, use extreme caution. Be really, really careful when you have to go to raw SQL. Uh, bind variables are essential for being able to do those queries safely. Um, and you really want to make sure to avoid any kind of string concatenation or formatting of anything that came from the client, because the client is bad and out to get you. Does everybody know what bind variables are? A couple heads nodding know. So basically, most... Um, SQL servers give you a way to basically put a token in where you're going to have an input string. So instead of having to do string concatenation, which you have the um, unfortunate problem of having you know, extra quotes or whatever to end your string, the bind variables take care of that by just saying, this, whatever passed in here is the string. Whether it has escape characters or not, it's the string. So it kind of protects you and insulates you from that string concatenation issue. Right. It makes it someone else's problem. All right, we've survived the number one uh, web application vulnerability. It's time to talk about broken authentication and session management, number two. So this is where an attacker can use leaks or flaws in your authentication or your session management code to impersonate some other user. Uh, and the problem with authentication and session management is that there's really a lot of people doing roll your own stuff. Because, uh, you know, why not? It's, not? it's not hard to do that, right? So it's the kind of thing that a million people implement a million different ways with the same kind of flaws in them. Uh, and this can lead to compromised user accounts, compromised administrative accounts, uh, and again, uh, unauthorized use of some kind of privileged functionality, so like getting into your admin uh, tooling and, and stuff like that. Um, do we actually do some exercises on this, Dave, or are we? I don't think so. Yeah. So luckily, this is a thing that Django does really well, uh, deals with this pretty well, and has it baked in. So. To prevent this kind of uh, attack, you really want to talk about uh, making sure your uh, passwords are hashed and encrypted properly. Uh, you don't want to let user credentials be easily overwritten. So don't make it super, super, super easy to have someone come and reset your password. Um, you definitely don't want to do anything that has session IDs floating around in, in the URLs, because that's uh, a 
real quick trip to a bad place because you can go and manipulate that session ID and now you look like you're somebody else. You want to be able to have your session IDs time out. Uh, you want to also provide your users an ability to log out. That might sound really obvious, but there are places where people forget to implement logout functionality. And if you can't log out, then now your session is still floating around there, and the next person who comes to use that computer at like a uh, library or an internet cafe is you, and now you're in trouble. Uh, and you want to rotate your session IDs after a successful login as well. And at all times, use you know, a secure transport for uh, passwords and session IDs. So that should all be over HTTPS if you're passing passwords and stuff around. Uh, specific to Django, uh, use the Django contrib off. Uh, they I mean, this manages most of that stuff for you, so you don't yeah. have to do it in a bad way. Uh, there's a really decent uh, middleware for timing out sessions that you can use. Um, and we're going to talk about the transport layer security stuff a little later on. All right, so we blew through that. Hooray, awesome. Nobody's going to have problems with managing sessions now. Uh, so cross-site scripting is where we get to do some more bad stuff to ourselves. This is actually the most prevalent web app security flaw. Um, <clears throat> injection came first because it's got a little bit more uh, potential impact and risk to it. Um, but basically, in a cross-site scripting or XSS attack, uh, the app is going to include some user-supplied data in the content that goes out into the browser uh, without properly validating or sanitizing it. So what you're doing here is putting things into a page that someone is going to then have interpreted on the client side and, and hurt them. Uh, and there are three different kinds of cross-site scripting attacks. There's what's called stored, where injected, injected code is permanently stored in a database. Uh, so that could be like a message forum or a comment. Uh, we had not so much a, a cross-site scripting thing, but we had an interesting flaw a number of years ago where I, I started seeing uh, a particular traceback coming in, and we get two of them at a time in this bizarre context, and it was a thing that wouldn't possibly be hit just normally. And it ended up being uh, some comment embedded in a Spanish language uh, forum where somebody was trying to link to one of our pages. And for some reason, instead of linking it, uh, they put in an image tag. And so we get this kind of stuff coming at us uh, through that kind of stored mechanism. Uh, a cross-site scripting attack can be reflected where injected code uh, is in a live request to the server and then it's reflected back in like an error message, a search result, something that goes into the content of the page. Or in the DOM, uh, where injected code in the browser DOM environment causes scripts to run in a way that's uh, unexpected. So maybe you're tampering with the URL and some JavaScript on the page is going to read that URL. Or maybe you're uh, managing to tamper with a variable that some JavaScript on the page is going to pick up and use to go do something else. So if you have one of these kind of vulnerabilities, the kinds of things you can do with it. You can execute scripts in a victim's browser. You can hijack sessions. You can deface sites. Uh, you can insert hostile content. You can redirect users to other places. Uh, you know, load them up with uh, malware, hijack their browser, do bad stuff. And it's most often seen in places where user-created text is displayed to other users. So like comments and messages like we talked about. Uh, it's often found in form inputs, although less so now that browsers are getting savvy about it, uh, where you might have a value that gets repopulated or pre-populated with user-supplied data. Uh, and it's also uh, seen in script tags where user-supplied data is often populated into a variable that the script is going to use. So the first exercise we're going to do is about cross-site scripting uh, by manipulating a dynamic portion of a, a URL. So part of the URL path is, is uh, variable uh, and is not validated, and it will get included into the page. And I'm trying to remember how long we want to do this one for. So we're going to basically uh, manipulate the path to uh, change the page title. And uh, I think... I want to think like seven minutes, eight minutes. OK. Does that sound good to everybody? Awesome. I'll do eight. Yeah. All right. Quick show of hands. Uh, raise your hand if you got it. All right. 
Folks who didn't, you guys want to see how this works? All right. So basically, uh, what we're going to do, and the hint is to look at the uh, path here and then see what it does in your uh, markup. I saw a couple of folks doing that up here. So let's take a look at the solution. Um, so what we do is we want to interrupt. If you look in the page source, uh, should we look in the page source at the script? So we have this my var that gets set to be whatever is in the path here. And so what we need to do is we need to terminate the string, get some other code injected in here, and then be able to deal with the uh, additional quote. So that's hard to see that from way over there. OK, so the URL for this is basically going to have uh, the closing quote and semicolon to terminate that statement. It's going to set the document title to please hack my users. And then we need to make sure that we have an additional uh, quote at the end so that we can deal with the rest of that string that's still open. And so let's click that. And so it does all this, and hooray, we've been hacked. Oh, no. So view the source on this one. script go. Yeah, there we go. So you can see by syntax highlighting that we closed off the string. And then our arbitrary code is just sitting here in the middle. And then that last quote just made it so the, the JavaScript browser didn't choke and start showing errors to the user. It just yeah. thought it was an empty string. Yep. All right. Any questions about how that works? All right. So another way you can uh, do XSS attacks is using uh, query string parameters. So in this case, we're going to have some unvalidated user input coming in in the query string, and it gets included in the paper. Is that what we just did? No, that was dynamic URL. So uh, could be real similar. Uh, so we've got a uh, query string with awesome data in it. I wonder what would happen if we did stuff with that awesome data. So you want to talk about this exercise, Dave? The whole I mean, thing so this is another fairly side. JavaScript heavy one. You, you, you basically want to add an image tag into the browser, and the URL that it points to needs to be that that test image JPEG. And so you can use the same kind of technique, using, but using the query string to get an image into the browser. So this is this is kind of JavaScript heavy. So if you're not really familiar with JavaScript, just raise your hand when we start. We'll walk around and try to give you some hints. But it, it's very similar to the other exercise. We want to do this like five minutes. You guys want? I heard a lot of murmurs for solution. You guys ready for that? Oh, okay. So basically, what we want to do is uh, we can use some interactive Python to make our lives easier for uh, getting this all quoted and ready to go into the URL. You want to walk through all the stuff that it does? Yeah, so, so basically, at, at a high level, we needed to get the JavaScript into the browser and into the web server. So we had to URL encode it so that we actually had the right things to put in the query string. But the actual JavaScript itself simply does. Um, <laughs> and that would be my timer going off. Yay. Basically, ends the, the um, HTML, the actual string in the HTML, and creates a new element called IMG. And then effectively, this just adds some stuff to it so that you can't see it. Right? So now it, it points to an image. So this will ping someone else's server. Display none means you can't see it at all. And then we put it at the bottom of the body. So now the browser will render an image that you can't see that pings another server. So like imagine, instead of just this, it put the cookie on the end of a query string or other information of yours to this remote server. Or created a script tag. Script tag. I mean, you can do anything. I mean, you can see any arbitrary JavaScript in this would work. Success. We've added our image to the page. Oh, I think our I think our thing didn't do the uh, Oh, we didn't do the display none on this. This is a short version. 
Interesting. OK. So if you did this with the display none, it'll actually uh, notice that as well. OK. So the last thing we wanted to talk about with cross-site scripting uh, exercises was cross-site scripting as it applies to form fields. This is where the value part of an input is going to be manipulated, uh, maybe you know, terminate the value early, allowing JavaScript to be injected into the rest of that element, like adding an on-click to a form element. Uh, unfortunately, there are two things wrong with this exercise. One is that we have a bug in it that would mean that it doesn't work right right now. It can never work right. Yeah, so we should fix that. And two is that many browsers are now actively preventing this kind of exploit from even happening at all. And believe it or not, it started with Internet Explorer, of all things, <laughs> no. would actively notice that you were trying to add like an on-click or do stuff to the value, and it would uh, escape the string in a way that it would be harmless in the markup that got rendered. And since then, other browsers have started to do this. Um, when I tried this earlier with Safari, Safari just gave me the big gray, we can't load that page. Your thing isn't there. Um, can, you, can you go to the source of the form real quick? We yeah. Do you want to see that? Talk about it briefly. Chrome still allows it? No, or okay. is the error. Oh, OK. Yeah, so do you, what do you want to show in the? Go down to the form part. OK. Somewhere here. I think you have to scroll up. Oh. Looking for so the, the intent of the exercise was to, in an input, so we're, we're just basically parroting the value out into the form. So if you actually had a double quote and a greater than, HTML in the browser would basically close off and you can do whatever you wanted in HTML. So the thought was that you can add a script tag or an, your own input tag or whatever you wanted after you closed off the original tag. But most browsers are starting to actually filter that out and let the user know something happened or flag it in the JavaScript console. Or like Mike said, his browser just won't even load the page when you try to do yep. it. So when we started this, it was about two years ago and it worked almost all the time, and then IE started to fix it, and I think everybody else got jealous and wanted to kind of catch up <laughs> No, with I don't think anybody wants to be shown up by IE in their uh, <laughs> security situation. So life is weird. So now that we've talked about cross-site scripting a little bit, I have an important question for you. Can you trust your database? What do you guys think? <laughs> All right, so right, you might have stuff that already got into your database that was bad news, malicious, and when it gets pulled back out, could be you know this is like the, the stored attacks we talked about. The store, you know once it's in the database, it's in the database and it can be played back to lots and lots of users who may just be like browsing around on your site. Uh, there was a problem on uh, Facebook at one point where you could do something, uh, you could le like leave someone a comment that would log them out every time they saw their wall. You can still do that, I think, on Gmail. Yeah, and I think we talked about that a little later on with the uh, CSERF stuff. Uh, so how do you prevent this stuff? We want to escape all untrusted data uh, based on the HTML context where the data is going to be uh, placed. And what that really means is be aware of where it's going and make sure that where it's going you're using it safely. If at all possible, uh, use whitelist input validation for things that are coming at you uh, in the query string or in form data, et cetera. Uh, you want to consider possibly an auto-sanitizing library for rich content. Uh, OWASP offers a thing called anti-SAMI. I do not have any actual uh, familiarity with it, so I can't tell you how good or bad it is. I don't either. Um, all the OWASP stuff is geared toward a very Java world, uh, and I don't do that. So, hooray Python. Uh, and please, update your parents' or in-laws' browsers. So when you're like home for Thanksgiving or Christmas, like, make sure they're all up to date and they're you know, all patched with uh, good new browsers. So specifically uh, for Django, do um, you want to talk a little bit about this, Dave? Yeah, I mean, the there, there's a bunch of different... Django actually prevents a lot of this stuff out of the box. And to get yeah. some of it to work, I actually had to do something bad to, to make it happen. Like basically, it sanitizes your outgoing data so that it actually auto escapes it. 
And you have to actually pipe it through a filter to go back to the original bad data or potentially bad data. So I did that so that you can kind of go through this exercise. But Django gives you other filters to actually go through and make sure things are safe, mark things as safe that you know. That means that, that it's trusted. That it is trusted. So like if you're in, a, you're in a, a blog and you leave a comment and you allow someone to add like italics or whatever, you, they're effectively making HTML and putting that inside of your database that's going to eventually come out to your user. So you need to make sure that um, that comes back out as HTML so you mark it as safe. But the problem is you just marked it as safe. Did you verify that the HTML in it is actually safe, and it's just the italics tag or just the bold tag. So, you know, Django gives you a lot of tools to kind of do this, but you also have to remember, like, uh, the anti sammy kind of thing to yeah. make sure the data is still correct, that it is what you thought it should be. Yeah, so you want to kind of, you know, if you find yourself wanting to mark something as trusted and safe, you want to take a step back and ask yourself, do I really want to do that? Is that really the right thing to be doing here? Um, you should be careful with writing your own template tags. Uh, the Django utils HTML escape function is your friend. Uh, so if you're if you're writing a, a template tag that emits HTML, you're effectively emitting HTML. So if you are not careful, any user input will go directly into that that page. Yep. Uh, if at all possible, use the form uh, as p as table or as ul to uh, do your form rendering in Django. Um, but I know. If, some folks have seen that or not seen that yet. Um, basically, what, what Django lets you do is if you've got a form object that has data in it, you can ask it to automatically render itself, and it will handle uh, safely escaping all those things for you. I'm sure most frameworks have tools that do this kind of thing. You just have to make sure you look at them and test them. All right. Any questions about uh, the cross-site scripting stuff? Was it easy? Like when you saw the solution, did you, were you surprised that you can actually attack someone's site with like little snippets of stuff? Most of those are not really trivial things to do, though. Yeah. It, well, like you said that you need both. You need cross combinations of things. Yeah. Together. Yeah. That's so what's interesting. There's a lot of tools now that you can go download that'll actually test a lot of these things, and so the, the person running them doesn't even have to understand them anymore. They can actually just run the tool, say this site has this problem, and go try to figure out how to exploit it. All right. I think I want to do at least one more section before the break. Does that sound, sound good? I think the, Sounds good to me. I think this one's not too bad. So the number four is insecure direct object references. What does that mean? That's a lot of words altogether there. Uh, so a direct object reference, an insecure direct object reference, is where uh, you've exposed a reference to some internal implementation object without verifying that someone is authorized to actually have that. So uh, you know, say you've got like uh, an ID of some record, and that's out in the query string or in the URL, and that's directly exposed. You can start messing with that and seeing if you can get somebody else's data that way. So an attacker can go and change the URL or those get or post parameters or modify their cookies that are sent to the site in an attempt to basically impersonate or gain access to something that's not theirs. So possible consequences here. You can compromise all of the data that can be referenced by that parameter. So if you're out there with uh, unique IDs for all the email messages in your email system, and that's like a URL, well, guess what? Now you can start walking through people's email if you don't protect against this. Uh, unless the namespace is, is sparse, right? So if you don't know or you can't easily predict what those values are, then it's hard to walk that namespace. But if you have something that's a sequential identifier, it's trivial to then just go and script that and start walking through it and harvesting up all that data that's available to it. So uh, for our, our exercise for this one, uh, we're going to manipulate some parameters in a URL and access data that doesn't belong to us, because we're being evil jerks. This is actually a really short one, so yeah. you should be able to just take a look and try to figure out how to get to other stuff. So this is basically about exploiting a uh, user profile page and seeing what other stuff we can do. You want to throw like five or six minutes on the clock on this one? Let's go ahead and, and walk through this. So if you access your profile page, and oh, hooray, I'm user number one, and 
I can change my name and my email and my password. Well, I wonder if, you know, this page is probably just checking if I'm, you know, logged in at all. Let's see. Oh, I'm user number two now. Oh, I can change my name. I can change my email. I can change my password. Oh, and I could be an admin. Hooray! Now I'm an admin and I can go and do bad things for the rest of the site, get into trouble. So now this is on the top 10 list of things that people have problems with on their website. Look how, I mean, it's trivial to just enumerate the users and just collect all the data. Does anybody have this kind of problem on their site right now that they can think of? I see some weird looks in their faces. So I don't think <laughs> it's okay. So. All right, so we want to prevent against this, obviously. So what should we do? So we need to implement access controls on any of those direct references to restricted objects uh, or to restricted resources. So you want to make sure that you know, when you're querying for user number two's data that you're actually authorized to do that. You should maybe only do that where, you know, maybe throw some where clause going on there or verify uh, beforehand that the logged in user matches the user that you want to see. Um, Another idea is to implement per user or per session indirect object references. So let's say you had like a drop down with six items in it that you would pick from. And those might originally be IDs of you know, records in your database. In an indirect object reference, what you do is instead of having those be 123, 124, 125, 126, they can be 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever. And then on the back end, you turn that number that was submitted back into the actual value that you want to go look up. So that way, the uh, object reference is never exposed to the client side at all. Specifically for Django, uh, a couple of not too hard things to do. Django's got built in ways to do that kind of extra query where you want to make sure the owner of the object is the guy that's logged in and the ID matches the ID they're looking for. So you can use their permissions architecture to kind of help you do those kinds of things. And then um, if, you, if you're not using permissions architecture or you have some other needs, you can also just add that to the query set where you say, you know, some model.objects.get the ID, but you can also instead of that say filter the, the owner is the user that's logged in and the ID matches the ID. So it's, it's a really simple thing to do, and Django gives you all the tools to do it. It's just a matter of remembering that you need to secure everything at every level. Yeah. All right, the next one is um, not too bad. I think this one has a, a real light exercise, so we can go, I think, through this before the break, too. Want to do that? Sure. Okay. So number five is security misconfiguration. And this is maybe not something that as developers in a, a larger corporate world, you're not necessarily going to be as... as uh, impacted by, but certainly like in a startup or a, a, a DevOps or you know, a place where you're going to wear a lot of different hats, this is something to watch out for. So you want to watch out for insecure application settings, uh, unpatched flaws, uh, unused pages that are out live in the world. Uh, we had some Backstreet Boys promotion. I think we launched in like 2000, and it was suddenly generating errors in like 2006 or 2007 because we just never taken the page down after it was uh, out in production. Good times. <laughs> Luckily, it didn't have security problems in it. It was just like, you know, it's out in production, it's launched, it's live, and we just, you know, forgot about it. So things that could possibly, you know, bad, bad things that could happen to you, some consequences. Again, unauthorized access is a biggie uh, to data or functionality. And the, you know, super huge bugaboo, complete system compromise. Ooh. Uh, so we actually have a couple of demos and some discussion rather than a, a full-on exercise for this. Um, and I'm trying to remember what all they were. Dave, you want to talk about these? These are things that you were uh, wanting to talk about, I think. Yep. I mean, you can go to either one of those. Lines. Sure. So basically, Django Debug Toolbar is a tool you usually use in development to help you understand what queries are being run on a page, what memcache hits are happening. And it gives you a lot of information about the current request and the current server and other stuff that helps you debug. But a lot of people leave that on in production because when they 
you find out there's a bug or whatever. It makes it really easy to go and figure out what's happening. But if you do that, there's a lot of things that, that could show up that you don't want people to see. Like, can you go back to the Oh, yeah, you want the debugger back yeah, up. Debugger. Sorry. So, like, in this case, um, if you open the... Uh, yeah. It gives you a lot of information about the settings. It gives you the actual SQL that was run if there was a database query. So like I was saying earlier, when you're trying to figure out how to do injection, you need to know a little bit about the database, a little bit about the query structures maybe. Well, this will tell you exactly what ran and show you how long it took. And sometimes, depending on the database engine, it might even show you some st statistics about how it ran or what indexes it picked. And that's powerful information if you want to figure out how to exploit the database on someone's site. Um, also, like, you know, signals and other headers and stuff, it'll show you exactly what the browser sees when you're doing stuff. So when you guys were trying to do certain attacks, you didn't really know what the server was seeing, you just got bad feedback and tried again, this might tell you exactly what the server sees so that you, you have an easier <coughs> time to try to manipulate those parameters. And this is readily available? Yeah, well, a developer has to put that on their site. It's a, it's yeah. a middleware plugin for Django. Okay. But most people do it because it's really easy to develop and debug stuff. But the problem is that a lot of people leave it on or hide it in different ways. Like I actually had a client that had a, a query string parameter that turned it on and off. And if that ever got leaked out or someone found it somehow in a weird way, then all of a sudden they're compromised. So the other one is basically debug mode in production. This is just the Django specific thing, but it probably applies to all frameworks. When you're in debug mode in Django, instead of getting a nice 500 page that shows you like, hey, we're sorry, we're down, it actually like drops a trace back. And like, if you click on local bars, it shows you like at every level. Where are they hiding? I'll do that. At every level, like the data in that frame in Python. So it gives you like so much information about that request that you might be able to look and figure out what you can override or what you need to do to override certain parts of the site or behaviors on the site. And then it gives you here's a list of the environment variables and other stuff that were part of that request. And all your settings. Yeah, uh, it's smart about the database, so it will. Yeah. At Not least show the start out the password, yeah. That's good. <laughs> but in general, like oh. giving anybody this amount of information about yeah. your site that you don't want them to see it, that could be really bad for you. Yeah. At least it'll also start out the secret key. So to prevent the security misconfiguration issues, you really want to make sure that you've got a repeatable process for hardening your environment so that you can, as you spin up new servers or uh, you're doing maintenance and you need to replace servers, uh, you can make sure in a repeatable way that you can always bring something up in a secure, awesome, uh, solid uh, state. And it's not just the app, too. It's the yep. server, the, you know, the OS itself and all the patching that, it, that gets involved yep. in that. Yeah. And you need to have a process for keeping on top of updates and patches for the things that you have in your environment. And it also uh, helps if you architect your environment in such a way that you have secure separation between components so that things are properly isolated. You might need a firewall in front of your database, you, uh, especially if you've got like payment data and stuff in there. And periodic scans and audits are really important, especially, again, if you're dealing with uh, payment data, like PCI requires you to do uh, you know, periodic penetration tests, regular scans of your application, uh, on you know, annual review with a uh, QSA to make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So this one is really about you know, the process and, and doing it right. Uh, so specific Django advice, like uh, Dave's talking about. Debug mode. Yeah, certainly don't run, don't run debug mode in production. As nice and convenient as it would be, it's just a recipe for bad news. Uh, really, the secret key is called a secret key for a reason. It should be secret. And, and that applies to any of the credentials you have for keys or passwords for anything. Yeah, uh, not something you want to uh, commit in your uh, GitHub repository and push up to the world. Uh, be careful about that. Uh, you want to keep Python code out of your web server's uh, doc root so that if somebody's like marching around just trying URLs, they can't actually see your Python code. That'd be bad. Uh, don't run admin, the Django admin, publicly if you can help it. Uh, if you uh, have to use the built-in admin, don't use it for normal user tasks. So things like a user going to like mess with their profile, make them an actual profile page or profile application. 
So for, for those of you not familiar with Django, it gives you like this default admin yep. screens that allow you to go in and just basically manipulate anything. You can look at all the database uh, records. You can change them all. You can do a lot of different things to it. But if you put that publicly and someone somehow gets on access to that, either by tricking an admin or doing one of the other exploits to get access to it, then all of a sudden they can do whatever they want to your site in, in the most worst way imaginable. Yep. So what you want to do is hide it somehow, either so only the company that you're working for could see it or run on an internal URL so that you know, DNS can't even route to it. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but you definitely yeah. don't want it to be public to the yeah. world. Yeah, Twitter got in trouble a couple of years ago. Uh, they actually had their admin site hosted on www.twitter.com. And they had a social engineering attack that got uh, an admin user's credentials compromised. And then somebody got into their admin tooling and did bad things. That's scary. Yeah. So don't do admin in the public if you uh, can help it. So yeah, we talked about this being a, an awesome gateway to being socially engineered too, right? So um, actually, no, we, there was a specific thing we wanted to talk about, right? Um, Which one? This was the... Uh, was it, what, I'm trying to remember the point we wanted to make about this. Uh, we wanted to talk about um, if people know debug things like, uh, and they could exploit you at like... Uh, like a former employee or something, or well, I mean, like any kind of social yeah. engineering attack is is easier than you would think. So if you know enough information to make someone think that you're on the in, like you know directory paths, and you can say, "Hey, I'm in," you know, slash disk to slash whatever, and people say, "Oh, they must be a developer here because no one would know we have this idiotic structure." Right. Then it, they'll it, trust you a little bit more. Right. Well, especially if, you're, like, if your environment is large and you don't know all the developers. Yeah, you're, you're in New York and someone's in California. You call and say, hey, I'm working for, and you just know the name of somebody. You give them enough information to trust you. And you start to build that relationship very quickly over the phone. And then they give you something that they shouldn't give you. They give you access or they run a, a simple uh, or click on a simple link that has an exploit in it that allows you to get their password. Or, and there's a bunch of different things that kind of tie together to make a real exploit happen. So like each one of these things is, as you're going through them, you can kind of feel that they're very similar in different ways. It's because a lot of times they're used at the same time to really exploit something. You do some social engineering, some cross-site scripting, and the cross-site scripting does an injection attack, and everything's kind of interconnected, and it allows you to exploit some part of their systems. Yep. All right, it is 3.46. Um, we've got some lighter exercises for the back half. Uh, but I want to go ahead and just take a break here because you guys have been in this room all cramped up and crowded and an awful lot of you. So I, I, like, I don't envy everybody.